Welcome to the Peer to Peer Podcast. New perspectives in diabetes, new targets, new therapies, and a new approach to patient management. This activity is sponsored by the France Foundation and is supported by an educational grant from Bristol Myers Squibb and AstraZeneca. Today's discussion, titled When Should We Use SGLT2 Inhibitors, is presented by Dr. John Gurick and Dr. Stephen Whitman. Let's listen in. My name is Dr. Stephen Whitlin. I am a professor in the Department of Medicine at the University of Rochester. Uh, my colleague is Dr. John E. Garrick, who is Professor Emeritus in the Department of Medicine at the University of Rochester. Our topic today is going to be when should we use SGLT2 inhibitors? So firstly, why SGLT2 inhibitors? It turns out that the normal individual clears approximately 180 grams per day of glucose. And that number actually incre is all absorbed in the proximal tubules of the kidney. Patients with type 2 diabetes actually hyperabsorb glucose so that they may absorb even more glucose, although because of hyperglycemia, there's more glucose in the urine. Therefore, it makes perfect sense to try to inhibit that excessive uptake of glucose as a treatment strategy for type 2 diabetes. Certainly, the majority of patients with type 2 diabetes are not getting to goal with our current therapies, and a therapy that can function such that it does not cause weight gain and, in fact, might cause weight loss and does not require increased insulin secretion, which would be a benefit. So it turns out that 90% of the glucose that's absorbed in the proximal tubule is absorbed through a mechanism using a transporter known as the sodium glucose transporter number 2, or SGLT2, which is a lower affinity but high capacity transporter in the proximal tubules, and 90% of the glucose that is in the proximal tubules is resorbed through this mechanism. The 10% that escapes is generally taken up in the so-called S3 segment of the proximal tubule by a sodium glucose transporter called SGLT1. It turns out, therefore, since the bulk of the glucose is absorbed through SGLT2, that it is a reasonable target for inhibition to treat diabetes. Furthermore, because SGLT1 is also found in the gut. It has been shown that nonspecific inhibitors, such as fluorazine, can induce diarrhea because of blocking the SGLT1. So picking selective SGLT2 inhibitors makes a lot of sense. I was going to ask you, do these agents do anything else to improve glycemic control? Do they affect beta cell function or insulin sensitivity? Well, it turns out that directly, it's not clear that they do. However, indirectly, because they improve glycemic control, because they do not enha enhance insulin secretion directly, that they reduce glucose toxicity, that's been demonstrated, they induce weight loss, and therefore enhance both insulin secretion and insulin sensitivity. Now, there are uh, several agents in development. Only two have been approved is that correct? In the United States, canagliflozin has been approved and is on the market. In Europe, dapagliflozin has been approved. Dapagliflozin in particular has a 1,200-fold selectivity for SGLT2 over SGLT1. Cana has about a 200-fold selectivity of SGLT2 over SGLT1. The initial concerns in the United States were, although there were no reports of increased overall cancer with dapagliflozin, that there was a, a signal for prostate, bladder, and breast cancer, and therefore it was initially not approved in the United States. However, it is currently sitting for FDA approval consideration as we speak. And there's another uh, one that's been submitted to the FDA, right? Empagliflozin? Empagliflozin. Uh, Empagliflozin also has been studied. It is also an SGLT2 inhibitor that is highly selective. All of the three, these three SGLT2 inhibitors actually have a uh, C-max at two hours. That is to say they act very quickly 
they're all very specific to uh, SGLT2. Now, where do they stack up in terms of efficacy in lowering HbA1c? Have there, there haven't been any head-to-head comparisons within the class, but there have been uh, comparisons between um, these agents and sulfonylureas and DPP-4 inhibitors. Where do they stack yeah. up? They, these agents certainly have comparable hemoglobin A1c lowering to DPP-4 inhibitors. Um, they have comparable, perhaps teeny bit less eff- efficacy compared to uh, sulfonylureas or metformin, depending on the study you look at. But Certainly, there is between a 0.5 and 1% hemoglobin A1C reduction in most of the studies that have been performed using these SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, because these agents cause uh, loss of calories in the urine, they uh, induce some weight loss. And uh, where do they stand with side effects like hypoglycemia, um, effects on urinary tract infections or genital tract infections? Um, Yes. In terms of hypoglycemia, there is minimal to no hypoglycemia that's been reported both uh, in combination with metformin, in combination with DPP-4s, and as monotherapy. Um, In the presence of sulfonylureas, there can be some hypoglycemia, but it's very unusual. And certainly, one would be cautious when using secretagogues or insulin in combination with these in that the dosage might need to be reduced. As far as urinary tract infections are concerned, there is a small increase in urinary tract infections that has been reported in most of the studies using SGLT2 inhibitors. The major concern along those lines has been more in terms of mycotic uh, vulvovaginal infections especially, and to some degree balanitis, which has been reported especially in uncircumcised males. Now, uh, there haven't been any long-term studies uh, of safety on the kidney. Do we worry about adverse effects of this uh, mechanism on kidney function? Um, there seems to be in patients, especially with moderate uh, renal Uh, dysfunction, that there's a mild decrease in calculated uh, glomerular filtration rate based on the formula of EGFR uh, looking at creatinine levels. But these are clinically small. They're on the order of falls in 3 to 4 ml per minute. And they're transient, right? And they are transient. They may, to some degree be based on uh, fluid fluxes because of the osmotic diuresis that occurs. Now, there's a hereditary condition, familial uh, glycosuria. Do do these people get into uh, kidney problems? Um, They don't. um, Just to be more specific, most of the cases of familial um, glycosuria are due to mutations in SGLT2 and these people do not appear to get hypoglycemic. They do not appear to have really any significant abnormalities, particularly in the heterozygous forms. There are unusual forms, such as mutations of hepatic nuclear factors, where you get other dis- other disorders that go along with it, but that does not pertain to SGLT2 inhibitors. Now, as I recall the ADA guidelines... These agents would seem to stack up very uh, favorably against what we have uh, at present. They, unlike your secretagogues, you don't have a risk of hypoglycemia, don't get any weight gain. They have a diuretic action, so you don't get any um, edema. Uh, so far, there have been no bone changes. Um, where do you think these uh, fit? Right now, everyone pretty much uses metformin as a starter. Where would you place these uh, agents? Well, certainly, were cost not an issue, I think that these could very, very well be a good second-line therapy after failure for metformin. They, if anything, drop blood pressure a teeny bit. They cause weight loss. 
They enhance insulin sensitivity uh, by ameliorating glucose toxicity, presumably, and enhance insulin secretion. They, as you said, don't cause bone loss. Um, they don't cause hypoglycemia. They don't cause GI upset, as far as we can see. So they look to be excellent drugs because they appear to be safe and efficacious and do the things that we'd like them to do, as opposed to, for example, sulfonylureas, which after insulin are the highest, are the leading causes of hypoglycemia worldwide. I see um, a role for these agents uh, as a potential competitor for prandial insulin. These agents work on both fasting and postprandial levels. And if you have a person on, let's say, metformin and uh, a basal insulin, and they're not achieving their HbA1c goal, it's usually because of not controlling postprandial glucose. So you could use this agent to try and control the postprandial glucose levels and not have to have injections or uh, frequent monitoring of uh, plasma glucose or risk of weight gain and hypoglycemia. I think that's an excellent point. I think that you absolutely could use them. Um, and in those patients especially who are lean type 2s because they've had it for a long time, in patients who have latent autoimmune diabetes, and that's not an insignificant population uh, from the, of the overall diabetic population, these absolutely could be considered to substitute for insulin. And the good thing about them is that they only really work when the glucose level exceeds the renal threshold. And they have durability because they don't depend on beta cell function. So as long as you maintain renal function, these agents should be um, continuously effective. That makes perfect sense to me. This concludes the discussion. We would like to thank Drs. Gurick and Whitland for their contributions and continued support. Thank you for listening. To receive credit, please complete the evaluation form found on the website www.t2diabetescme.org.